and then to have the storms like right as you sort of put together an offering and you work out what you're going to be able to do with what you're sitting on you know the storms and then you know, like people can't even get out here anyway so it's, it's pretty bad. Like Today on Dirty Linen, we are talking to Soren Turgeson, head chef at Seville Estate in the Yarra Valley outside of Melbourne. It feels like this pandemic has been interwoven with other disasters related to weather. We've had fires, we've had floods, and recently on the outskirts of Melbourne and in Gippsland, we've had just terrible storms and rain. Uh, One of the areas that's been badly affected is the Yarra Valley, so I'm really keen to check in with Soren and hear how things have been at Seville Estate. Uh, Welcome to Dirty Linen. Thanks, Danny. Thanks for having me on the podcast. It's really good to have you on, and I'm sorry that the reason that I was prompted to reach out to you is a post that you guys did where you were like, we've got no power, we've got no phones. Um, And, of course, you've also been dealing with a recent lockdown and then... 25k restrictions where not everybody could visit you uh fill us in i mean how are things oh it's relentless isn't it look it's It's relentless that's a good word (laughs) yeah uh look we're we're trying to remain pretty positive um you know we're kind of just adapting with with every blow that comes along just trying to trying to keep moving forward and you know remain relevant you know keep sort of you know adapting the the offering so that we're we're still sort of present in people's minds and still getting out there. Well, tell us what happened with the storms. Uh, look, to be totally honest, I slept through the whole thing. I, I basically woke up and it was carnage. Um, yeah, yeah. My, my wife told me the next morning um, all the damage that was going on through the night. Uh, yeah, it, it sort of brought things to, a, to a, another halt, like riders were hoping to get the wheels back on. And... Uh, you know, we're, we're pretty lucky out here that we have the generator. So, you know, once we were able to gain access to the building, you know, we thought maybe we could put together an offering and, uh, you know, see some people come through the doors. Uh, but then even, even with that, we had generator issues, you know, no, no telephone. So it was just, it was really just trying to make the best of a really, really bad situation. Um, well, for people who perhaps haven't seen any TV footage or photos on socials, like just explain the extent of the, the storm damage and, you know, what you could see around you. Well, like my drive to work, I, I live in Croydon and I've, I've never seen so much damage. Like dr- driving down Cambridge Road, there was, you know, just 35 trees sort of like down uh, in the area. Like there was power lines down. There was just trucks everywhere, arborists it's a field day for arborists. Um, I, I really wasn't sure. I was surprised that I was able to make it to work that morning. Uh, you know, there was another, like once I actually made it to several, trying to drive down our driveway, again, more trees down covering. So luckily we, we've got another entrance to the, to the restaurant. So, you know, it was a very slippery drive through the vineyard, um, you know, but we're able to gain access to the building and we're, we're surrounded by trees. So I'm, I'm super surprised that we didn't have, damage done to the building to be totally honest wow and in terms of i mean it sounds like you wouldn't have been that surprised seeing trees and power lines down on your way you wouldn't have been that surprised that there was no mains power to the estate was i mean what what was that situation well we're, we're pretty lucky that we, we have this generator and when we lose mains power it you know it only takes a couple of seconds and it'll kick on so i did feel pretty confident that i was going to arrive here and we'd still have have power and uh, you know, be able to do a do a better assessment sort of once we're inside, and um, you know, try and work out the extent of the damage elsewhere. And I mean, that's so lucky because I'm sure a lot of businesses, you know, without generators, they'd be instantly looking at huge loss of produce. And I mean, <laughs> I mean, oh, what are you? What are your friends in the area telling you about that? I just, it's just so. This is a cascade of just terrible difficulties. One after another. I mean, yeah, like we're, we're super lucky with the generator, you know, like having the lockdown for one week, you know, sitting on all the produce hoping to open. We were like, all right, we'll be able to get by for one week. And then there's the extension for two weeks. And then it's, you know, reassess again, cull what you've got left, try and work out, you know, what you're going to be able to put together. And then... Uh, and then to have the storms, like right as you sort of put together an offering and you work out what you're going to be able to do with what you're sitting on, 
you know, the storms and then you know, like people can't even get out here anyway. So it's, it's pretty bad. Like, you know, um, I think we're, you know, we're lucky with the generator and, you know, we had people, people working pretty hard to try and gain access to internet. Uh, like Tony, Tony, the experience manager, for instance, was driving to McDonald's to try and get in touch with people to explain that, you know, uh, we will still be trying to put something together, you know, like just try and drum up and, and you know, keep any business that we could. So, yeah. Oh, it's just a lot. <laughs> it's funny. I've heard a few people, you know, have been on social media or whatever it is, making phone calls to radio stations saying that they're in the car park at McDonald's. It's uh, as much as, you know, we might like to um, think we're all too good for Maccas, it does come through <laughs> with at least some facilities at times. Um, goodness me. And so tell us, Aaron, about the 25k restriction because when Melbourne sort of started to ease out of lockdown city residents weren't allowed to travel more than 25k by the time this podcast comes out that will have been relaxed what kind of impact does that have on you sort of there on the outer edge of the city look it's 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 a massive one really like we um like with the with the last one when we had the lockdown and we had the 25k restrictions like I think we were just putting together a uh, a several at home package at the time, like just trying to put together uh, a, a dining experience as close to what we would offer in the restaurant to be delivered, um, you know, to to people within the area. Because like the 25K thing is just so like debilitating for us. Like, you know, it's it's such a, we, we rely so heavily on the, on the, um, the diners from the city trying to get out to come out here. So when that's taken away, you know, it, it takes away a lot of the, you know, a lot of the demographic that we can sort of draw upon. So it is very hard. Um, we do have some very supportive locals, um, you know, and, and we will always see a few through, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it, it, yeah, it's, it's super hard when we're given those restrictions, trying to, trying to see a way forward. Yeah. And what about now for like, let's say the weekend coming where Melbourne people are allowed to travel, but everyone's heard about, you know, the devastation in your region. Have you had bookings coming in already or do you think people are still a bit tentative? No, look, we, we have had bookings coming through. Um, and I think that's it. Like just as soon as we're able to, we, we get the message back out there that we are open, our offerings together, you know, um, it's, it's, you know, the offerings are as good as they've ever been. So, you know, there's, there's no real reasons for people not to come out here now. Um, and and it's, it is actually showing in the bookings. So, you know, people are still super keen to get out of the city. And, you know, like even with the storms through this area, I think people would be even more understanding and want to show their support because they know how hard hit the area has been. Yeah, 100%. Um, one thing I haven't heard much about is how the vines have travelled through this bad weather. I mean, luckily, all the fruit's off um, by this time of year, but has there been much damage to um, the wine-growing infrastructure or any of the vines themselves? But we're, I, I thought there would be a lot, but we've been pretty lucky here. So, you know, as you say, like all the all the grapes are off the vines now and they're sort of, you know, starting to harden up and head dormant ready for pruning so you know we've had a few trees down around the area um and on the border of the property but you know not too much damage um to the vines per se and with the infrastructure around here like i i I would have put so much money on there being damage to some of the sheds but the the trees around just sort of stood strong Thank goodness. <laughs> That's really good. Well, we're going to just count our blessings, hey? Yeah, absolutely. We, yeah. Okay. We're really, really lucky in this storm. Goodness me. Well, uh, one, um, a lot of people would have um, heard about Seville and perhaps travelled there for the first time over summer with um, the Attica summer camp. Um, what was that like for the region? Awesome. Really, really awesome. Um, you know, it's having having sort of a, an establishment you know of that caliber out in this area like it's it's good for everyone you know um you know it's 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 friendly competition it, it brings people out here you know there's just it's a spotlight on the yarra and especially the upper yarra like out here it's you know uh the lesser known side i guess and uh just just networking like we've we've been able to sort of piggyback off 
off some of the suppliers, uh, you know, they, uh, we've got better relationships with them um, coming out this way just because of the draw for Attica, I guess. Like, um, you know, since, since, since they've closed down, we've been able to sort of piggyback off some of the staff there and it's, um, yeah, it was a, it was a awesome positive for the area to have the, the summer camp. It's a shame to see it go. Well, it is a shame to see it go, <laughs> although I feel like um, I'm also kind of glad that they didn't have to deal with um, trees down and all that kind of stuff that you guys have been through. Um, yeah, but it is fantastic because I know that they brought in a lot of really green local staff, so that's fantastic if that's been able to sort of contribute to the staff pool for the area. I mean, staffing something that you can have a long conversation with anybody in hospitality about at the moment. I mean, any time, but especially now. What's it been like for you sort of retaining and retraining staff during this period? Look, we, we were pretty lucky for quite a while, like through the first couple of lockdowns. And um, like we've got a pretty, pretty small, tight team here. Uh, but then a, sort of around the start of the year, I guess, um, you know, my, my wife, who was the restaurant manager, she sort of stepped away um, to sort of have our son. And I had another chef leave from the kitchen. And uh, just with the, you know, with not having the internationals around, there was definitely a skill shortage in the area. And the, the demand on agency chefs in particular, like, you know, it, it made it really, really hard for us to uh, to maintain a, a consistent product, I guess. Like it was, it was really hard trying to manage, uh, manage a, a reduced team without sort of getting those skills in that can sort of like learn the way that we do things and consistently do it over and over. So um, it's been pretty hard. We, again, like landed on our feet and we've had some, you know, some great staff who have, re- have recently come on board. And I think there's, there's more in the works, you know, from, from Attica Summer Camp. So you know, I, I, there's there's so many people out there that are worse off than us. Like we we did it hard for a while, but we're definitely landing on our feet now. So, well, Soren, tell us tell us about the fun stuff. Tell us about the food that you're doing there. Um, how you use the local produce, and and also if there are ways that you've adapted the menu to cope with the staff that you've got. Um, tell us about that as well. Uh, well, I guess when when I first came out here and sort of like set up the concept, it was to it was to do what I had seen tried at so many other restaurants but never really seen through and that was to you know to do local seasonal food that that did evolve with the seasons and uh you know and really highlight the the local suppliers and uh, uh, you know so many restaurants had, had preached it and tried it but you know just through whether it's accessibility or what but you know it slowly becomes less and less of a priority and it's a real shame. So when we first started out here, it was like, that's, that's paramount. You know, we're going to make sure that we're always highlighting producers of the area and we're always going to make sure that the menu is evolving, you know, as it needs to with the, with the season. So, you know, we, we, started, we started with a weekly changing menu and, you know, it, it was awesome. And it was super testing. Like, you know, I, I think, you know, we, we managed to keep it up for sort of the first two years and, like I'm, I'm drained. Like I think every every dish that I know how to do, I've done. You know, like absolutely exhausted. Like really, really awesome. Um, but yeah, very, very testing to sort of keep evolving. So uh, where, where we're at now, it's you know we've we've simplified things a little bit more, and it's it's not that we were ever you know super complicated food. We always tried to remain quite simple. You know, showcasing the produce and and technique. And, and now I think it's even, even more so drawn back. Like it's, you know, uh, it, more than ever, I think we're highlighting the quality of a seasonal product, um, which, is, which is really, really exciting. And I wasn't sure how it would go, um, pairing it back to become, you know, as, as simple as, as it is now, but it's just been so well received. So, you know, I was always a bit scared to, to go that simple, but it's, you know, it's working and it's fantastic and it really does help for us to not have too much product on hand for when these sort of lockdowns happen, mm. you know. So. <laughs> it's just, yeah, I mean, you're always evolving a menu, but you would never have thought two years ago that you'd be lockdown proofing a menu. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, give us an example of a dish that you're doing at the moment that really speaks to your style. 
Uh, all right, what are we doing at the moment? So, you know, I guess we've, we've sort of just come through the um, – wild mushroom season so we've we, we we get so many pine mushrooms on the property out here and then also working alongside um our, our local mushroom supplier uh john ford at unearthed mushrooms you know we'll we'll get some of his incredible um mixed mushrooms from out there and then we've also got some of the pine mushrooms which seem to have stopped now but we've got plenty of them confied when the, when it was a glut we harvested them all and we've got them confit down. So it's a really simple dish of, you know, it'll be a roasted mushroom puree, some sautéed confit pine mushrooms. We're going to roll some uh, local lamb shoulder and then just have a nice uh, herby pangrattato over the top with some gremolata and a, and a mushroom jus. And, you know, truffles have just started. So we're going to get our man, uh, Adrian Utter from Buxton out here and hopefully get some of his fresh truffles if he can make it through the black spur. And... Uh, and then, yeah, we'll be able to put on a, a really simple dish of, you know, mushroom, lamb and truffle. Oh, my goodness. That sounds so good. And I've actually been to Buxton Utter Truffle Farm, um, yeah, over the hill there. And it is I found a truffle the size of my fist. It was so exciting. Um, and then we lit a fire and cooked it up on the on the top of the hill there and it was just one of the most incredible, memorable days I've ever had. <laughs> just that, that feeling of, I guess, being in partnership with a dog that finds the truffle and then very, very carefully um, digging around it to pull it out of the soil. It's so special. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I, I completely agree. I um, I was lucky enough. I went out there and did a did a day with him with the with sort of the uh, the last kitchen team and uh, I've got another one arranged for for next week hopefully we're going to get out there and, and do exactly that so you know head around the the um, truffle grove with Lily's dog and hopefully pull some truffles out of the ground and Lily that beautiful spaniel she's such a legend yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> such a beautiful dog she's so special she's a hero of the Victorian food scene that's for sure yeah definitely uh, that's great. So, I mean, you you didn't start your career in the Yarra Valley. Tell us what took you there. Um, it's a funny story, actually. I uh, uh, My now wife and I were living in St Kilda and uh, I was working on Chapel Street. And I, we just, we were living in a, in a, uh, a four-story apartment on the top and we didn't, we didn't have space for a dog. So, ultimately, it was like, well, let's, let's try and move. Let's find a place with the backyard. And, uh, you know, we had a, a very modest budget to work with so you know we started sort of looking out and then a bit further and a bit further and a bit further and then all of a sudden I'd applied for a house in Talangi like up in the hills behind Hillsville so and, I, and we got it so there, there we go there's our move we're moving from St Kilda to the country and uh it was it was all just to have a backyard and a dog so I uh, made the move out and uh, I was in touch with Jared Hudson, who was the head chef of Giant Steps at the time. So I uh, made the move out there and sort of started working with Giant Steps when it was, um, you know, I think it was a rebrand, sort of a relaunch at the time, new kitchen, new space. And it was really, really awesome. That was my introduction to, uh, you know, the Valley and Valley Produce and, you know, working out here. And uh, it was through through my wife who was working at Levantine Hill who uh, knew our uh, experience manager out here, Tony Layton, and uh, got in touch with me and told me about this new venture, uh, sort of, a, again, a rebrand out here and, a, you know, uh, relaunching a dining space. And, you know, they wanted to put a, an intimate dining room in and do a simple offering with uh, using the local producers. And, you know, it sounded like everything I wanted. So came out here and history ever since so i mean it's so different to cooking in the city uh, oh for sure like tell us tell us what you like about it and are there any drawbacks um i guess look cooking, cooking out here is phenomenal like you know it's doing what we're trying to do and stick to local suppliers is limiting to a degree but you know because the product that we have out here in the yarra valley is so good like you know it's it's really not that bad <laughs> like you know we are working with fantastic produce um you know i guess it's there's there's key days out here whereas in the city you know it's it's a bit more consistent throughout the week and you can you can plan your plan your your weeks and your time a bit better in the city whereas out here it's sort of be a little bit more adaptable and you know just 
you know, you have to be okay with change out here. Um, uh, but look, I, I'd probably struggle to go back to the city. Like, you know, if you could see what I'm looking at now, looking, looking over at the valley, like there's, there's no reason like you would ever want to leave here. <laughs> like it's, it's such a beautiful place to be, to come every day, you know, and cook the type of food that I want to cook every day. It's, you know, it, it really is fantastic. That's great. That's really good yeah. to hear. And um, what have you learned about yourself and your, I guess, your personal qualities, your professional qualities through this pandemic? Um, what have I learned? Uh, I, I'm not a very good pruner. I don't have the patience to work in a vineyard. But I think, okay. like, um, you know, with, with the lockdown when we had the, the long haul, where we were lucky enough that it is a multifaceted business and we could, you know, the, the whole restaurant team was able to just move out into the vines and, you know, we helped with, with harvest and then we helped with pruning and tying down and, and vineyard maintenance, which, you know, I, I, we, we are so lucky in that sense where so many other businesses just, you know, it's, it's not an option. They just sort of shut the doors and that was it. So, um, you know, moving out into the vines and, you know, learning a new skill, learning, you know, to drive tractors and learn about the grapes and, you know, when's the right time to pick and how to pick them properly. And, you know, it's, it was, it was an interesting time. Like, you know, it, it takes a certain type of person to be a chef, you know, you're attracted to pressure and heat and intensity, uh, you know, and especially in this kitchen with all the change, like, you know, you really have to be on the ball. And then we move out to the vines and it's, you know, it's five weeks of, of pruning the same, you know, the same task. So very, very testing. And, uh, you know, there was a few characters that, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm surprised we didn't ruin the vines. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, like it, it was a good experience, I guess, to do something new. And, you know, it just shows, you know, like how adaptable this business can be and, you know, it's it's really, really good. Yeah, that's great. It's interesting because I suppose, you know, as a chef, you're always putting your spin on things and being, you know, thinking about how you can be creative. But I bet that's not quite the right mindset for pruning a, a vine. It's just like there's a right way and a wrong way or is there is there some leeway? Look, there's a right way and a wrong way. And then there's the way that some of the chefs will do it, which, you know, like <laughs> somewhere in between. Um, okay. You know, like a bit of plating up vibe for a, yeah, for a vine. Yeah, exactly. Artistic flair in the tie downs. <laughs> um, yeah, it's you know. Interesting. It'd be fun if you yeah. could bring like a like a single block um, wine out of that, like the chef pruned vines. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. That would be. Um, yeah, that would that would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but so I suppose even though you realise that that wasn't your new calling, it must be good to have had that experience. I mean, I'm sure that there's stuff that you, you could learn and, and take forward. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, and I, I think from that experience, a lot of the team, um, you know, they, they found that they did have a bit of a passion for vineyard maintenance and since then have sort of, you know, moved from the restaurant team to sort of working part-time out with the vineyard manager and, you know, there's definitely been some pros from it. Like, I don't know, there's, there's been quite a lot of pros from this. Like, as much as it's a really horrible situation, like, it's, you know, a, a lot of good has come out of out of lockdown, you know, with, with time to think and reassess. And, you know, like, we, you know, we were able to sort of implement new systems and structures to sort of help, you know, protect the business and protect the staff and, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, try and go about things a little bit better, which, you know, before before we had the break and the time to sort of like stand back and look at things, you would never notice. So That's interesting. What's an example of something that you've been able to tweak, and, you know, perhaps something that other people might not have thought of? Well, you know, like it's just the small things. We're like with the, with, the, with the restaurant team sort of thing, like we've always tried to maintain, you know, programs of like value adding things for the restaurant. So with the garden in particular, um, but it's, it's such a condensed, hard working week here. Like quite often it's hard to, to, uh, find the time to really stay on top of it, but you know, it's, it's definitely something that we, you know, we hold a lot of value for. So even just restructuring the working week and tweaking the food offering so that it's more manageable and to allow us to have the time to really stay on top of it, you know, like it just, 
it didn't dawn on me, you know, until we were able to sort of stand back and say, like, look, this is a must. We really need to do this and we need to make these little changes here so that we can make sure that we're, you know, we're getting what we need over here. So what do you mean by value add? Well, I, I think like, you know, produce produce off the property is is uh, it's a beautiful thing. Like, you know, when you when you're dealing with something that you've grown yourself, you 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 know, you pay it more love there's more detail in it it's got a better story you know and it's it's so nice to be able to explain that to people so so really making sure that we stay on top of you know a, a garden program for instance is just something that's you know right the yeah because yeah i guess you do go around the place and see some produce gardens that were you know i guess dug out and planted initially with the best of intentions but then the the week just sort of gets away from you and then they're all a bit straggly and then they end up just buying produce just arrives on the back doorstep is that sort of what you're talking about yeah that's sort of what i mean like it's you know it's you know we we've we've sort of you know we've had that happen here as well like you know we we started the garden with the best intentions and then you know there's been times where it's just kind of got on top of us because you know it is such a condensed working week trying to find the time and not having a gardener made it really hard but you know having the lockdown you know it sort of put things into perspective that we need to make sure that it's part of the program we a had time through the lockdown to really you know get back on top of it again but then just make sure that there's always that time every week to stay on top of it yeah yeah, really, really good to come out of it, being able to, yeah, carve out that time. And, um, yeah, I guess even to see that it's important is really valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so good. Well, it's great to hear the positivity, even <laughs> amongst a pandemic and some crippling storms. I've, you know, we've learnt over the last day that um, people in some people in the Dandenong Ranges are going to be without power for three weeks. I just can't imagine how terrible that is one of my chefs is in that position how are they feeling about things uh look she's she's a pretty positive girl and um you know she's she's got on a brave face but i I know she's i know she's going to be feeling it um so i think you know we'll we'll obviously do our best to make sure that she's got you know (laughs) food food sourced at least you know packaged up and We'll try and make her life as easy as possible, but it's you know, I I don't know how I would deal with that. Like you know, on top of all the things, you know, to to be to be out of power for for a month, it's going to be like, yeah, it's just huge. And they're not supposed to drink the water at the moment either. I mean, you just yeah, it's like what else can be thrown at us? Don't I, I, I don't want to know. Don't tell me. <laughs> Let's as long as those mice don't come down from New South Wales. But it really is. It's like what is it? What's what is it going to be this week? Yeah. Well, hopefully, what it will be is delicious lamb shoulder with beautiful pine mushrooms and truffles, um, and happy customers that just want want an extra bottle of wine and want all the add-ons. Uh, that's what I wish for you, and um, <laughs> you. give my regards to your your chef who's without power, and give your dog a pat as well because it sounds like it was very good uh, lure to the Yarra Valley, and great for all the people that come and dine with you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Soren, for having a chat to us today. It's um, yeah, fantastic to get your perspective and, yeah, all the best out there at Savile Estate. Take care. All right. Thanks so much, Jenny. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about. We spend a week thrashing around each issue, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This.